Hello folks, welcome to Saving Time. This is my 1950s vintage Cordobat. Now, the history of this company is really kind of fascinating. It's colourful to say the least. Unfortunately, my watch here does not run um, and it came partially disassembled. So before we dive into a restoration, I want to show you the way we film here and my reasoning why. So this is just a look at the sense of scale we're dealing with. A lot of this stuff is not particularly visible to the naked eye. So we film a lot of macro shots and we film a lot of split screen to help you both see the minute detail but also keep you uh, informed of where we actually are within the watch so I think that's uh, a nice balance of giving people very detailed shots now as I mentioned this watch uh, does not run the balance there uh, balance staff pivot is broken that we all should not wobble now the seller did say it was running and as you can see it does if you Put your tongue at the right angle and squint. It does kind of tick, but that's never going to run uh, with a broken balance pivot. So I'm going to do the disassembly here. I won't go into too many details of what I'm doing. I'll do that during the reassembly. For those of you that are interested more in the minutia, what all the parts do and where they go, I'll be covering that a bit later on in the video. But for right now, I think I should probably explain the somewhat clickbaity title of this video in reference to Rolex. Now, Cordoba made many movements for Rolex over the years. Most notably, they supplied Rolex with the Calibre 618, which actually went into the first Rolex Panerai reference 3634, for those of you who are interested. They also supplied other movements for Rolex. Um, one in the 1940s, the late, the mid-1940s, 1944 to be exact, which is probably the only movement that Rolex didn't stamp their... Um, branding all over because they were supplying it to the Germans and I'll, I'll leave it to you to to figure out why they perhaps didn't want Rolex stamped all over that. Cordobert themselves were always a very very high quality manufacturer uh, maker of movements it's one of the reasons Rolex used them back in the day even back in the day Rolex was considered you know a very high quality watch brand and they wouldn't have used movements from people uh, that weren't also very high quality so the price difference is quite astonishing as you can imagine that first Rolex Panerai goes for thousands of dollars even up to the tens of thousands of dollars whereas a watch like this can be bought non-running a little bit uh, scuff like this one for I think I paid a hundred dollars for this one but I have seen them go for four five six hundred dollars depending on you know the condition uh, provenance and all that kind of good stuff now Cordobert themselves were one of my favorite manufacturers because just They've done everything in the watch world, really. They unfortunately fell victim to the quartz crisis in the 1970s, like a lot of Swiss manufacturers did. But before that, they are credited with the first uh, digital display wristwatch. So we'd call it a jump hour now. But if you've seen sort of a modern digital watch, you'll know what I'm talking about. So the actual movement itself was created by a guy called Joseph Paul Weber at the age of 25. Now, I think uh, he's just overachieving there a little bit to make the rest of us look bad, but, you know, hats off to the man. That tech or that patent was then licensed to IWC, a um, very famous Swiss brand, who turned around and licensed it straight back to Cordobert for sale in France and Germany. So in 1920, they actually came up with a jump hour wristwatch that I believe was the first to market. They are in credit. Uh, they are credited, as I mentioned, for creating that first digital display. So that's kind of interesting. Their supply of movements to they were uh, an Ebush movement manufacturer, a bit like uh, ETA, ETA are today. They supplied movements for quite a few companies, including, as I said, quite a few to Rolex. Now, for a person like me, I'm not going to be opening up a Rolex Panerai or a Rolex anything probably for quite a while yeah I'm just sort of finding my feet within this industry uh, within this hobby uh, and I, I really do not want to put my skills to the test on tens of thousands or thousands of dollars of watches even not until I've done quite a few more and I imagine a lot of you out there in YouTube land are in the same boat now 
The other interesting thing about Cordoba is in 1927, at the behest of Mussolini, they created, uh, Italian Mussolini obviously, they created a watch brand called Presio and sold watches in Italy um, throughout the 20s, 30s and 40s. In fact, the brand Presio is still going even though Cordoba is uh, defunct. Now, Italy at the time in the late 20s was how do we put this a little bit nationalistic? I'm not going to say the word because YouTube would demonetize this video really rather quickly if I did. Um, but, you know, I think we all know what Italy was in the late 20s, 30s and so on. So because of this, they didn't want wristwatches that weren't created by Italian companies. So Cordoba just kind of stuck an Italian name on it and uh, sold it anyway. Now, they also supplied in the late 40s uh, the Russian watch factories with equipment that was used to really jumpstart the Russian watch industry. And in fact, a lot of early Russian watches were simply straight up copies of Cordobert's movements. Now, I can't actually find the history whether Cordobert licensed the movements or just sold the equipment. My guess would be that they sold the equipment and the Russians at that time period simply copied the designs. But it's almost a running joke amongst watch collectors like myself that the records were lost in a fire. Obviously, Rolex nowadays doesn't want to advertise the fact that back in the day, it didn't make its own watch movements. Now, that being said, Rolex didn't simply take a quarter vert movement and bung it in a Rolex, stamp Rolex on it and call it a day. They actually do a lot of work to those movements. So Ibush movements are still very common today. They're used by a lot of um, really, really good Swiss brands. Hamilton comes to mind. The Hamilton I'm wearing right now has an ETA movement in it, uh, slightly modified by Hamilton. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. Uh, a lot of watch houses would like you to think that they make all of their stuff in-house. This is not true in most of the cases. I mean, the big three, Bacheron, Constantin, AP, and Patek Philippe, people like this are obviously manufacturing in-house. A lot of other people, Hamilton, as I said, springs to mind. Oris, uh, I think the Oris Aquis is a great watch, but it has had several different movements over it in its time period with ETA refusing to work with Oris. Uh, so they've had Salita movements in them and, and so on and so forth. These movements are normally modified by whoever is using them. Now again, just to iterate, this doesn't, it's not a bad thing. A lot of people, especially recently, have jumped on this in-house movement bandwagon, myself included, I will admit. But companies like Rolex used the best movement for the job at the time. In fact, Rolex only went fully in-house when I believe they integrated uh, Egler, the watch movement manufacturer into their business. They completely purchased it in 2004, I believe. I could be wrong on that one. So again, in-house movement or out-of-house movement, there's arguments to be made for both. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have a bad watch just because the base movement, the Ibush movement, wasn't produced by the manufacturer. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these people that thinks everything needs to be produced in-house. Although for modern companies I do kind of prefer it. So back to the watch in front of us. Now I hope the split screen effects have helped you orientate you uh, into the process of disassembly here. I know I haven't talked much about it but I will be going over it fully with the reassembly. So we've got both of the bridges off here. The trainer wheels is almost out. The escape wheel is still in. I've just unscrewed the center wheel bridge but I'm going to remove all the components around it because it needs to be levered out which means taking off the pallet bridge here and the pallet fork that connects to it and then that bridge can be levered out. Now because Cordoba was such a high quality movement manufacturer there is always going to be a place for your screwdriver under the bridges so you can lever them up and unless I made it clear I'm a huge fan this is a very very nice movement to work on um, and for a hundred bucks you know if you're just starting out this this is really nice to work on. A lot of the Russian stuff 
and the cheaper stuff in general can be nice but it can also be somewhat of a nightmare to take apart i mean it's it's a horrible thing but when you first start with something like this you tend to have cheaper tools and you tend to be working on cheaper watches which can actually make the process more difficult so talking of cheap tools i'm going to use my cheap canon pinion remover here to remove the canon pinion which will allow that center wheel to just drop out of the watch uh, the center wheel is always press fit onto the canon pinion well not always but in the vast majority of this type of watch design it will be so our center wheel comes out and I can now remove the cover plate holding the minute wheel down. So do let me know what you think about this format of filming. I tried it on the last video. The response seemed to be overwhelmingly in favor of. A few of you uh, said you couldn't concentrate on all three of the screens at once, but that's not really why I'm doing it. I'm really more doing it so you can actually see where we are in the watch. I think it tells a better story. Um, of watchmaking and indeed in this case watch servicing uh, when I first started I obviously looked at a few YouTube videos I mean as we all do these days and one of the problems I had and there are some excellent watchmakers on YouTube far 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 uh, exceeding my present skill level like I'm not even close to a lot of these guys so I'm not trying to disparage anyone uh, I'm just going to say that if you're using one camera you're either going to be quite far away which makes it quite difficult to see the intricate details because again we go back to our scale here very small or you're so close up that when I was first starting I would often get confused as to which part was coming out of where in the watch now as you get a bit better that's that's not necessary but I'm trying to aim these videos and these are certainly not how-to videos but I'm trying to aim these videos at the more watch collector the more casual observer um, you know, a lot of people have said that they don't really have any interest in fixing watches and that's fine. They just, they went down that YouTube rabbit hole. I'm sure you know the one, you know, that you start looking for some innocuous piece of information on YouTube and six hours later, you're deathly afraid of the Illuminati and you're under the covers with a tinfoil hat on. You know, I'm sure we've all been there. So if you are watching this, wondering why you're watching it and why YouTube recommended it to you, welcome. I hope you enjoy it. Um, but we're going to get the spring out now. Again, as I was mentioning, I had so many positive comments on the last video, so thank you all for that. One of the commenters said that I'd been using a plastic bag, a little bit of plastic over this to, to contain the spring. And somebody commented that a piece of Radico, which is watchmaker's blue tech, it doesn't leave residue, on the end of a bit of pegwood might be a better idea. So I'm trying that out here. It works really well, so thank you. I can't remember the name of the commenter, unfortunately. But uh, I've received so much good advice. It's been, you know, kind of overwhelming, really. Um, I haven't, I think, had a single negative comment. So one chap that told me I talk too much, which, you know, fair, uh, to be honest. So this watch is completely disassembled. Now, as I said, I will be covering it in detail. Um, in the reassembly process in a minute. Now I need to take the spring out. As you'll see, our lid there goes shooting up into outer space. Bit of pegwood uh, to cover the top of that to stop that happening would have been a good idea. Now our spring here is not in the best of condition, but I'm gonna get it out. Now I'm gonna be careful here not to let this spring away on me. So I'm always gonna keep one fingernail or one finger hooked over the vast majority of the spring as it uh, comes out. So, and again, this is, if it wasn't clear already, this, I am not a professional watchmaker. Um, I hope to be maybe someday, but right now I am getting started. I know a little bit, but certainly a lot of my commenters are a lot more knowledgeable than I am. So do check down in the comments to see what mistakes I've made. I, I normally try and leave my mistakes in, as you'll see, there's a few in this video. Um, Watching a master craftsman on YouTube at work is is, is a true joy, uh, which I am certainly not. But I do also believe that master craftsmen have tools that most people will have access to. They also have many, many years of experience. They often take uh, shortcuts. The work they do is very fast. So I don't always believe it's the best thing to watch as a beginner. Obviously, you want to mix a bit of that in. But... 
you know, I, I'm trying to not make a how-to video, obviously, but I am trying to give you a good look at my process. So I tried to scrub the bottom of the barrel there, which is where the spring lives, uh, with a piece of pegwood, but I believe the plating had just come off. So a bit of a cleaning montage now, not too interesting maybe, but just for those more nerdy types like me that want to see every individual part. And I want to use this opportunity to discuss a little bit the cleaning solutions that I use. So I use Elmar Waterless Cleaning and Elmar Pro Suprol, I think it's called. I will link it to clean the watch. I use an ultrasonic cleaner, just a bog standard cheapy one. And I also put the balance, uh, balance cock with the balance complete on it back in the watch for cleaning, just so the hairspring doesn't get tangled. Now, the reason I use these cleaning agents is they leave the surface perfectly good for lubrication afterwards. So they've been specially designed for this kind of work. I will link them there. They're great. They're a little bit expensive, but for a hobbyist like me, you're not going to go through that much. So I'm just oiling the bottom of the barrel here. Now, a little bit of Mobius 8200 grease, I'm going to say on this. Um, I'll link the oils down below as well. Now, I don't show every step of the oiling process because my videos already tend to be a little bit long. Um, and also, it's kind of difficult to film. I'm getting better at it, but getting better at YouTube in general, uh, he says, as he completely gets this wrong. So I use an antique watch winder to wind the spring back up. Now, my hand wandered off camera when I was winding it up, but I think you get the idea. You start the spring in there, you wind it, and then it winds. Now, springs either left-handed or right-handed or clockwise or counterclockwise, and I've put this one in upside down. So this will never work. The barrel arbor hook won't catch on the spring and it won't wind. So I only have watch winders that wind one way. And in that case, in this case, it was the wrong way. So I've 3D printed a little plastic washer here that I can squeeze the spring into. I can then turn the little plastic washer upside down and push the spring into the barrel. This saves you having to buy a left-handed set of winders and a right-handed set of winders as winders are kind of expensive. So push that into the washer and then push it out back into the barrel. Works like a charm. Now I sanded the inside of this washer so it was perfectly smooth. Uh, I left the outside a bit scuff. Didn't really see any reason not to. So get the barrel arbor back in. Make sure that the spring is going the right way. And there's a little plastic tool that you can buy. There are a couple of pounds, a couple of dollars that helps you push the lid back on without bending it. Now, I couldn't find mine in the last two videos. I promised myself I was going to buy another one, but of course I didn't. Um, so I 3D printed one. It worked like a treat. So we are on the reassembly process here and I'll start explaining now what's going in. So the center wheel is going in. It needs a little bit of oil at the bottom of it uh, around the stem here and it needs a little bit of oil at the top of it as well. So hopefully I will show all of these steps in the edit. As you can imagine these videos take a very long time to put together. I actually had house guests this week which slowed my process down so the barrel completes going in that's the one with the spring that we had to flip upside down that's the main power source for the watch and here is the center wheel bridge now i make a pretty grievous error here uh, concentrating too much on the three cameras and the filming so you can see our barrel complete there interfacing with our center wheel now you can see me start to fit the intermediate wheel and the other train of wheels wheels on top of that bridge that isn't screwed down. Now this is a ginormous mistake. Uh, this watch won't run right, um, which we'll see later on. Now the reason I obviously could have edited this out, so the reason I left it in is twofold. The actual troubleshooting process to see where our error was coming from is quite interesting. And one of the things I've loved about YouTube creators over the years is just they seem honest to me, if that makes sense. I've seen a lot of creators and um, a lot of creative people that leave in the errors, uh, some that edit everything out so it looks like they know exactly what they're doing. And, you know, if that's your style of video, I have no issue with it. But for me, you know, this is difficult work, especially when you get when you're getting started. And, and, I, and I think that the video should reflect that. So 
Now our train wheel bridge, go, not our train wheel bridge, our barrel bridge can go on. And the little thing you saw me put there was the set lever screw, which will undo the set lever and allow the crown to go in and out of the watch. So I'll just push those bridges on. Now I like to fit both at once so I can test the fit. Now, the barrel bridge is kind of easy, but the trainer wheels bridge takes a bit of finessing here. You really want to make sure that the pivots are coming through the top of the jewels. The jewels, if you didn't know, are the purple things you see on top of the bridge there. These will have the metal pivot from the wheel come through them. Now, this takes a little bit of finesse. You want to press very lightly, or at least I do it this way. I press very lightly with a piece of pegwood and just tease those out until you can see all the pivots. Now, it's worth noting again that we come here to that sense of scale. I can't actually see these pivots uh, with the naked eye. Even with four times magnification, it's very tricky to see those are coming through. Uh, so I use a pair of tweezers there just to make sure everything's seated right. And then I can move our first wheel or barrel complete to get to a feel to make sure the trainer wheels is running there. The first wheel, second wheel, third wheel, fourth wheel and escape wheel to make sure everything is running nicely. You don't want to feel any friction there. It should be as friction free as possible. The more friction you have, obviously, the less amplitude you're going to have in your watch, the less power is going to be getting to that trainer wheels. And a wristwatch you know, has to run for 40 hours most of the time on a single complete winding so there isn't that much power to be had now i'm screwing down the bridges once i've checked that the wheels are running freely and what i tend to do with this is i'll screw them down 90 percent of the way check the wheels are running freely again because sometimes the pivots can shift and then i'll come back and tighten that all up now our crown wheel goes on so i'll put a little bit of oil on the bottom where it's rubbing against the base of the movement um, as I said, I'm not going to show all the oiling steps, otherwise we'll be here until next week. Um, and I think a lot of you would get a little bored. But you can see on the plate, the main plate of the watch, where that had been rubbing, you could see some of the brass showing through the plating there. Now I also oiled the inner part of the crown wheel for the same reason. And I'm going to get this together. Now... I would have been wise here to probably put the pallet fork back in before this it doesn't make such a huge difference but just you need to realize that without the pallet fork the train of wheels is not locked up so if you go ahead and tighten the ratchet wheel for instance you can end up free spinning those wheels at supersonic speeds now that shouldn't be such of a problem um, again but it's just a good practice I think to get that pallet fork in there now I'm fitting the click spring which is what returns the click into the ratchet wheel to create a uh, blockage a ratchet mechanism to n allow the spring to store power as opposed to unwind that's a very fiddly maneuver those things will blast into orbit uh, the simplest provocation so as soon as I've got one of the springs in I like to get the wheel on top of it ASAP because you know I have gone to make a cup of tea before and come back to found my, my spring in somewhere over the south of France I assume uh, and you know these are not the easiest things to find spare parts for although it's not that difficult to bend your own spring so I'm going to put the pallet fork in now to lock up this movement so those wheels will no longer be able to spin freely a pallet fork goes in, pallet bridge goes in, same procedure, you need to double check that the pallet fork pivot is coming through the jewel like that before you tighten that down, otherwise you're going to bend your pivots and you're going to have to be a little more talented than I am to unbend those, that's a real art form. Uh, Bergeon, the, the Swiss toolmaker, actually sell a pivot straightener which uh, is very expensive. Um, so I don't have one. Now there is something very wrong with this. Now when I go to move that uh, uh, first wheel there, you can see there's slippage. This it does not feel right to me. And it is of course because that centre wheel bridge is not screwed down. So this is what I meant by troubleshooting. So in order to correct that, I've had to take the trainer wheels bridge off. Uh, undoing all the work we did putting all those pivots in there and you'll see when I screw this down that it actually pushes down somewhat so without the screws in it it just wasn't doing its job properly um, everything was sitting a little bit high up but with everything back together that's 
perfect now or at least it feels perfect so I'm going to come ahead and this is where you'll see me make a second mistake here again I'm going to leave them in uh, I am not pretending to be something I am not here uh, so you know I'm, I'm also not um, trying to impress everyone with my awesome skills Brege, I am not but a little bit of oiling before I get the hour and minute wheel back on now I'm tending to oil here based upon an old book I read and also based upon just where it makes common sense so you can see me put the hour wheel back on here there's no cannon pinion fitted to this uh, I don't know why I missed it obviously um, I'm concentrating on the video uh, it's kind of difficult to get all these camera angles to line up but yeah no excuses here um, this intermediate setting wheel that just went on is indexed it, it normally is or at least a lot of the time it is so you have to make sure to put that in the right way up however that cover plate going over the minute wheel there is going to have to come out at some point because you cannot press fit the Canon pinion into a watch while the minute wheel is on there because it is a press fit you're going to use quite a bit of force and you can end up shearing the teeth off your wheels so we've got this capsule that sits on the other side of the balance uh, which we're going to dot a little bit of oil onto um, this is the screw from the beginning of the video that I showed you as a sense of scale so this is quite a fiddly maneuver but it goes back in in this case no problem and I still haven't realized that the cannon pinion is not in the watch um, obviously I will spot it because without the cannon pinion I couldn't get the hour hand on now a little bit of lube where our winding pinion is going to go in because that tends to wear on the back of the watch there and also a little bit of lubrication for our uh, sliding pinion here uh, and that should just drop in I think I'll give you a look at how those teeth interface it's quite a funny gearing system kind of like it it always looks very pretty to me um, your watch movements in general look very pretty to me as many of you who have watched me before will know I started out life as a watch collector uh, still am but doing this has, has given me a, a much greater appreciation for what it was I was actually collecting so I would definitely recommend any kind of hardcore collectors out there to go and buy yourself some cheap watch movements uh, hell even buy yourself a quarter bar um, it's it's cheap enough and take it apart and put it back together again now I'm using a uh, Mobius grease here on some of the parts and oils on the others I'm not going to go into precise details of what but I will list the oils I use down in the comments below if you want to find them um, they're very very common fairly industry standard throughout the watchmaking world now this is a much more heavy duty spring that's going the yoke spring as it's called that's going into the watch here so I'm actually going to cover this with a piece of plastic uh, I don't feel confident enough to do this without it because it's got a lot of power in it so if it does spring up the plastic hopefully catches it um, this has been a technique I've been using for a while now I can't remember where I picked it up but it works pretty well so the cover plate with the setting jumper there kind of like a spring that allows the set lever to interface with it and change the watch from winding to setting mode um, the keyless works we're working on now as it's called because you don't need a key to wind the watch so that that was an innovation in watchmaking uh, pioneered by several companies JLC comes to mind um, just because back in the day obviously you would have a pocket watch that would have a key to wind it maybe even a key to set it so that cover plate can go in you can see the hour wheel is now off the watch as I have realized that I did not fit the Canon pinion so mistakes like this are going to happen um, you can see I've removed the wheels where the, the minute wheel sorry where the cannon pinion needs to be pressed bit and I'll re-oil all of that before it goes back together uh, there's a little bit of oil on the bottom of the cannon pinion there to stop it rubbing and a little bit of oil once again under the minute wheel and you can see there I'm testing the keyless works and that would act to set the watch which we'll see more of later but now we come to our balance complete now I didn't manage to find a balance staff for this it's just kind of a shame I was hoping to do a balance staff replacement but I did find a new balance complete 
So you're going to see me remove the old balance here. Now I'm using a bit of cork and I'm pinning this thing down, being extremely careful not to hit that hairspring. Now one of the reasons for the extra pin is this watch has kind of unusual mechanism here where instead of a screwdriver slot to move this out of the way of those two pins that are holding the first loop of the hairspring for timing adjustment, it's got a hole through it. So I'm going to use an oiler. Um, an oiler is just the thing we use to put the oil on the watch. Uh, and I'm going to bend it out of the way. Now this is an extremely uncomfortable maneuver. If you slip here, that hairspring is going to be toast. Now in our case, I'll be replacing the balance complete, so the hairspring as well. But I hope to make the other corba I have at some point with a um, balance staff uh, replacement. So I genuinely don't want to damage this spring here so after that it has to go on a balance tack so you can push the hairspring stud out that's the safest way i've found to do it and that's the hairspring the hairspring is in relatively good condition but you can see there's no pivot on the bottom of that so without the balance staff replacement it's never going to work and again we go have to disassemble this uh, balance cock even more because we need to oil the jewel that's underneath now George Brunswick, I believe, and Fritz Marty in the 1920s came up with the ink block setting, which is the shock setting for the top of the balance cock. It's much nicer than this uh, method here. It's, um, it allows the watch to take some shock without snapping the pivot off, which is what happened to us here. And it's just much nicer to work with. So if you are going to try this, I'd recommend finding a watch that has an ink block setting, a shock setting. Now I'm going to clean the jewel in Bergeon B-Dip because this is a genuine pain in the posterior and without quite a bit of experience, even with experience, there is so much that can go wrong during this process that round concentric hairspring being extremely, extremely delicate. One slip and you are looking for spare parts. I know because I've been looking for spare parts on a number of occasions because of that one slip. So now it's oiled, I'm gonna put it back together. Now this is relatively simple, normally I wouldn't put two screws at once, but because this is all a bit floppy, I'm using those screws to actually index the position uh, of that jewel on the top, so it's a little easier. I've found if you put both screws on at once, again, do comment if I am doing this wrong, because a lot of this stuff... Um, I am going with a bit of common sense and what I've seen other people do, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do it. So I'm always open to suggestions. Of course, I've integrated many suggestions from subscribers into this into this process. Now, the difficult thing here when you're putting this, and this is the new balance complete, it's been through the cleaner. I managed to find a second on eBay. So this one has the pivots as they should be. Now you have to make sure that the first loop of the hairspring is between the those uh, pogo pins there and then of course you'll need to close that back up so I'm going to pin this once again uh, to close that back up just so when I apply pressure it doesn't go shooting across the desk onto the floor and become my latest cat toy because um, yes that's also happened to me so this is a slow and steady wins the race here you do not want to rush this uh, I think I prefer the slot in the top of this that's normally cut for a screwdriver. It seems to be a little easier. Um, there's nothing wrong with this. It did take me a while to wrap my noggin around. I'd, I'd never seen this before this watch, so I wasn't sure how to approach it. But the Euler technique seems to have worked. And with that said, I'm just going to screw up the, the screw that holds the stud in place here. So that's our balance uh, complete back on our balance cock and oiled and everything. And now I'm going to slap it in the watch and hope that it works because this is the moment of truth. And there we go. So that's probably the best sight you'll ever see as somebody servicing a watch or a watchmaker because there is no guarantee at all that that is going to happen until you get it back in the watch. So there's a little bit of dust on the top of the balance cock there from the uh, cork that I was resting it on to put the pins in. I'm going to go ahead and clean that up. We need to do some oiling on the top and bottom jewels. So I'll do the top ones on camera. 
Uh, and this is a very difficult thing for me to do because in order to film this, it means I can't use the correct level of magnification. It's one of the reasons I don't show the oiling of things like the pallet fork. Uh, I just, I can't get a good camera angle on it. I'm hoping to figure out a way to do that nicely and this a bit more nicely. But this is my fifth or sixth video on YouTube now. I'm getting a bit more comfortable shouting into the camera in an empty room like a total lunatic. But, uh, you know, I still have a way to go. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed this uh, video series. Maybe I've helped some of you, you know, make that first step into watchmaking. Take that first step from being a collector into something a little different. Now all that remains to be seen is the hour we all goes back on over the canon pinion. Which, <laughs> you know, um, if you forget the canon pinion, you, yeah, yeah, yet your watch is just simply not going to work um so dial goes back on now i will clean this dial a little bit with radico i kind of like the patina on this one uh corbat dials uh Corbair dials from what i've seen um age very well a friend of mine has one and, and those little dots will eventually go verdigris they'll go green and look like little lightning strikes which for some people would drive you nuts but for me I really appreciate the patina that these particular uh, dials, for whatever reason, how they were made, what they used. Um, and again, there's a few black spots on there that shouldn't be there. I'll clean those up before we go into the case. Now, the hands went back on relatively simple, just a press fit. And I'm going to spin the hands all the way around to make sure they're in alignment, but also to make sure that they don't knock into each other. So occasionally a hand can be bent out of shape. Well, I say occasionally a lot of the time. And the hands will go around and knock into each other. Now, I'm using a simple press here with a 3D printed... Um, uh, piece on the bottom so I can push the crystal down, fit the bezel on and then relieve the pressure which will allow the crystal to spring into the bezel. This is a better way of doing it than just simply trying to push that crystal down with your thumbs. I also did a quick polish on the crystal, some poly watch and some diamond polishing compounds and now we need to get the crystal and bezel back on. You can see here there's normally a cut or a lot of the time there's a cut which needs to be indexed to where the crown is poking out the watch. So you might want to make sure when you press fit this all back together that you press the back on in the right orientation. Nobody likes a wonky back and that you press that uh, bezel ring back on with a cut for the uh, crown. Now, nice crown on this watch. I don't think I showed it, but this watch is triple signed. The movement is signed, uh, called about and the crown is signed and the case back is signed so that's nice i'm giving you a look in the left hand corner here of this watch on a time grapher which for those of you who don't know is an instrument for measuring time now amplitude is a little bit low but i think that that spring was not in good shape after i had to unwind it and wind it so many times so i'm happy with that and we're running between four and seven seconds a day slow with a very acceptable b error for a watch of this age so i'm really pleased with the way this one turned out, the fact that it went from non-running to running, um, it's just a, it's a lovely sight to behold. And I've always wanted a Corbett, uh, but Corbett, <laughs> I always get the name wrong for some reason, so excuse me on that one. Uh, I've always wanted one ever since a friend of mine bought one, and then watch prices went a bit wampus and yeah so there we have it that was my journey into servicing and fixing this watch i hope you enjoyed it if you do leave me a comment like and subscribe all that youtube stuff i'm trying to build the channel up a little bit bigger um I, i've really enjoyed talking to people here i've met such a uh, such a lot of really nice people and as i mentioned i've only had that one comment that said i talk too much which is a criticism i will fairly accept so thank you all very much for watching and i'll see you in the next one